Hey, welcome back to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. I'm your host, Taylor Fossack. I'm the lead engineer here at IT Pro TV. And with me today is Sarah Lichtenstein, one of the engineers on my team. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. We have been off for the past three weeks while our studios have been renovated, but it's good to be back. Thank you for your patience and uh, thanks for listening. Today we're going to be talking about an article by Type Classes called Rounding. It was published way back on August 14th, and uh, we put it in issue 172 of Haskell Weekly. Um, but it was an interesting article, and uh, Sarah, could you tell us a little about why you chose to talk about it today? Sure. So um, I'm sure everyone has experienced this who's worked in Haskell before, where you go on to Stackage or Google and are trying to look up a function to use, and there's like four or five different functions with the same type signature. And you're like, what do I do now? Um, Cause they all do completely different things. And this article covers four of those uh, functions. Exactly. So. Uh, and all, the, all four of those functions come from the uh, wonderfully named real frac type class, um, which as you might guess from the name is for types that are both real and fractional. Um, but what does real mean? It's not like uh, not imaginary, I guess. Is there a better way to put it than that? I think that is the best way to put it. Um, <laughs> Real, like from math class, you yeah. know, real numbers. <laughs> yeah, I think we all learned about this in math, maybe high school. I don't remember. It's been a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and then fractional, uh, it means that it supports division, although it's not necessarily rational numbers. So a lot of the real frac type classes can represent things like pi, which is not rational. Um, but yes, but it is real. It is real. And it is frac. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, that's the type class that we're kind of talking about in general today, but the four functions in particular are uh, ceiling, floor, truncate, and unsurprisingly, round, since the whole article is called rounding. Um, but Sarah, could you walk us through ceiling? What is it? Sure, so ceiling is a function um, that takes one integer and goes up to the next one. So if you have something like 2.1 and you use ceiling on it, you get three. Mm -hmm. And what happens if the number is negative? back to the same next <laughs> integer. So uh, mm -hmm. negative numbers are a little opposite, so it always looks weird when you see that. Um, so for that same example, if you have a negative 2.1, it goes to two. Right. Because two is the next number up. Yeah, and this usually trips me up when I look at it because when I see ceiling, I think like it goes to the next biggest number and I think, oh, negative two, the next biggest number is obviously negative three, but really it's the next one like up. In a positive trend, yeah. yeah. Going positive. Mm -hmm. um, and then you mentioned at the top that a lot of these functions have the same type, type signature. So floor has the exact same type signature, but it does something kind of the opposite, right? What does it do? It's basically the exact opposite. So it goes down to the next um, integer. So in that same example, if we have 2.1, we get back 2. But if we have negative 2.1, that's where we get negative 3. Right. So exact opposite. But the type signature is exactly the same. So that's exactly. a little strange. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a couple we have to actually do our reading. Yeah, God, the worst part, reading documentation. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's a couple more functions with the same type signature. So there's truncate. Uh, what does that one do? So truncate just cuts off the fractional part. So in our 2.1 example, we get 2. Mm -hmm. And in negative 2.1, we get negative 2. So we can visualize this kind of like a chainsaw, just <laughs> slicing off that number at the decimal. Yeah, I always like to think about numbers and chainsaws at the same time. They go together mm -hmm. so well. Exactly. It really makes math interesting. <laughs> Very visual. Um, and yeah, truncate is pretty interesting because you could implement it in terms of ceiling and floor, where if your number is positive, you're going to do floor, but if it's negative, you're going to do ceiling. Um, exactly. I don't know that it's actually implemented that way, but it really helps me visualize when I'm not thinking about chainsaws, a different way to, to think about this one. Mm -hmm. Basically, if you have a handle on ceiling and floor, then you know truncate. There you go. And on to the most interesting one now that this whole article is about, which is round. Um, I think we can all kind of guess what this one does based on the name and our kind of elementary school math, but could you tell us exactly what it is that it does? Right. So round, as context clues would assume, um, goes to the nearest integer. So in our 2.1 example, for positive 2.1, we get 2, and for negative 2.1, we get negative 2. Mm -hmm. However... Round has this fun thing once you get to the 0.5s that has the uh, statisticians rounding. Mm -hmm. If you have something like 2.5, it's going to go just to the next even number. So from 2.5, you won't get 3, you'll get 2. Right. But then with like 3.5, what happens? You go to you 3? You get 4. Oh, you go to 4. Okay. 3 is not even. 
<laughs> so only the even numbers get rounded to on the 0.5s. Correct. Yeah, uh, you mentioned this is statisticians rounding. I've also heard it called bankers rounding. I'm sure there are more terms for it. Um, but yeah, it can be a little mm -hmm. surprising because usually, for me at least, I've thought of the 0.5s rounding up, but now they round to the even numbers. All right, sure, why not? Yeah, I mean, in like elementary school math, they always tell you if it's above, if it's 0.5 or above, you go up. So mm -hmm. now it's like, okay, got to relearn math. Yeah, thanks elementary school for lying to us. <laughs> um, so yeah, round uh, is, again, kind of the most complicated one among these functions. And in general, the way that I think about it day to day is it takes some kind of uh, fractional real number, real frac, and goes into <laughs> some integral number like, you know, an int or an integer or a word or a natural, something like that. So it's a pretty robust function. It'll do a lot of different conversions for you. Mm -hmm. I just mentioned integral, and uh, I think that kind of dovetails nicely with a function that can go in the other direction from the integral right. type class, which is obviously the type class in Haskell for integers. Um, and there's a function for that one called from integral, where you give it some integral type, like int or natural or whatever, and it converts it into some numeric type. So not even real frac, just any number, basically. It could be a complex number, could be an imaginary number. But yeah, it's a, it's a real Swiss army knife of a conversion function because it goes from so many types to so many other types. It's such a perfect descriptor for that function <laughs> because yeah. we really do use it for basically any conversions in math, at least here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have this, this Swiss army knife and we pull out the blade that goes double to int, or sorry, the other way around, int to double. <laughs> we pull out the blade that goes natural to float. Not that you should probably do that conversion in particular, but anyway. Yeah, we don't recommend that. We use it all the time, but we'll get back to that in just a sec. I think I want to loop back on what you said at the top of the show about these kind of all having the same type signature, but different implementations. So we have to go read the documentation. Um, and you mm -hmm. had a great term for this. What did you call it? Um, so this kind of reminded me of homophones from English. Mm -hmm. So um, homophones for words are words that sound the same but mean different things. Exactly. Um, so this is kind of like the is that programming word? version of this. Yeah, the same it's thing. The, yeah, it's these are our coding homophones. So exactly. We have some other good examples in the prelude as well. If you want to talk about some of those. Sure. Uh, there's one that deals, or there's two, I should say, that deal with lists and. We're going to talk about a couple examples, but there are probably hundreds of these things, um, functions that have the same type signature, but have different implementations. And the first ones that kind of popped into our head were head and last for lists, where head will take in a list and give you an element from it, the first element. Mm -hmm. Last will take in a list and give you the last element from it. So they have the exact same type signature, but very different implementations. And again, you have to just go read the documentation, or you might be able to tell from the names what they do. Right. Um, but it's always funny to me um, when we have to read the documentation for these things since Haskell is so lazy, but then we can't be that lazy. <laughs> yep. Yep. And, uh, you know, that's where good names come in because then you hopefully don't have to read the documentation, but then you might get caught up on something like rounding and think you know how it works. And, and then you don't. And, and then you don't. <laughs> Um, but there are some other ones, uh, some other examples of this, right? As, especially ones that deal with numbers. Could you talk about some of those? So, yeah. So there are two other um, great math examples. So max and min that are in the prelude. Um, max obviously gets the maximum and min obviously gets the minimum. And luckily, those two have descriptive enough names where at least for me, I'm not going to need to go and look at documentation. I can kind of infer what those do. Mm -hmm. Even though they have the same type signature, unless the person that wrote them is trying to trick us, we can probably guess what they're doing. Which hopefully no one who writes things is trying to trick us. <laughs> yeah, a lot of things start to fall apart if that happens. <laughs> um, so we've been talking about these kind of coding homophones. Do you feel like it? these come up because their type signatures are the same, but their implementations can differ? Do you feel like it's worth it in general to try to make their types different by introducing like a bunch of new type wrappers or type aliases or something? Or is it just kind of the cost of doing business? We have to deal with these. Well, I think it's kind of situational. For example, when we're doing something like from integral, I know that we like to make wrappers and functions and things that we can use to make that more suitable for us. That way we don't get as many errors and stuff like that. But sometimes it's just as easy to use these polymorphic functions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you mentioned that we sometimes use, uh, kind of monomorphic versions of from integral. And I'm sure our code base is littered with things like int to double equals from integral or mm -hmm. uh, natural to float equals from integral. And it mm -hmm. can seem kind of- I think of, just yesterday I did double to natural, which was from integral. Yeah. 
Uh, and it can seem kind of silly to define all of these functions that are just different names for this existing polymorphic one. But the benefit comes, like you said, from really pinning down the types that are involved so that if you're doing a bigger computation, um, Haskell by default will just sort of pick a type kind of arbitrarily in the middle, like, oh, you didn't tell me what to use here, so I'll use double. Um, <laughs> and that's glossing over a lot of details. But uh, by using these monomorphic functions, we can make it really clear to the reader of that code that this is the type we want to use in between all these other things um, without having to put any explicit type signatures, which can be a little clunky at the use site. Absolutely. And it definitely helps in our situation where we have a handful of engineers. And you know, if I'm going back to look at somebody else's code, if I don't know what's going on, it's going to be really difficult. But if there's a function that's just double to natural, I know exactly what's happening. Yeah, that's way easier to read, especially in contexts like going through code review, where you may not have GHC running for that particular chunk of code. You're just looking at it in a web browser, and you don't have to guess what type is coming in on the left here and what type is going out on the right. It's very clear from the name what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes that explicitness is really helpful. Mm -hmm. Another area where it's helpful is when you're looking for such a conversion function. And I know that we've run into this a lot, um, especially with the time library where, well, won't get into time, but even for like, <laughs> even for something like double to int, um, I've seen that pop up as a question like on Stack Overflow or here with our team, how do I go from this type to that type? Because if you search in Google, which is an amazing thing and can give you a lot of great answers, you may not get an answer for that. I haven't actually done the search to see, but if you search for double to int, there aren't many monomorphic functions with that exact type signature. But if you know about round or ceiling or truncate, all this stuff, you would know to reach for one of those because uh, those two types match up. Um, but by providing this monomorphic version, we can have something to hang documentation on and say, hey, this goes from double to int and it rounds and be watch out for this weird even rounding that you may not be familiar with. Mm -hmm. I think it really shows, um, first of all, how versatile the prelude can be. And secondly, how useful it is if you kind of know those base functions because you can turn anything into anything pretty much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's remarkable. Um, and in, in addition to the documentation, it can be really useful for people learning Haskell to find one of those monomorphic functions like double to int and then go look at the definition of it and see that it's uh, double to int equals round. Like, oh, mm -hmm. wow, I didn't know that they could do that. Uh, so it kind of teaches somebody while also making the code clearer at the same time, which win-win as far as I'm concerned. Exactly. So we've mentioned that we use these functions a lot in our code base uh, to kind of help type inference and help code review and stuff like that. Uh, one thing we didn't quite mention yet is uh, warnings. So we compile everything with the dash W everything flag, which is a little pedantic. We do turn off some things, but GHC will actually warn you when it chooses one of those type defaults that I was talking about earlier. So if you have some big computation and in the middle, it just decides to use double, it'll warn you about that. So we use these monomorphic functions to avoid those warnings sometimes to really pin down. Yeah, use this type here. I know that's, that's what you want to use and we'll say it explicitly. Mm -hmm. And the best part about that is that GHC does warn you. So mm -hmm. yeah, you that don't... compiler is real nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good friend of ours, that GHC. And just to kind of give a little color commentary here, uh, we went through and looked at how often we use all these functions we've been talking about in our code base. And from least popular to most popular, they are truncate with exactly one use case, floor <laughs> with also one use case, ceiling with two. So none of those three get used very much in our code. But then you get to round and we've used that 31 times. So we reach for round frequently. And a lot of the places we reach for that are defining another function. So th this count here doesn't include those other functions like double to int, it's just round. And then going in the other direction, we use from integral even more, 36 times. And again, that uh, we define a lot of helper functions with from integral. So these are conversion functions that we reach for frequently and we use all the time, but it's been nice to do this deep dive on them and really figure out, you know, how they work and what they mean and some interesting comparisons between them with all these code homophones. Absolutely. Thankfully, we've been able to dive into all of this because of this excellent article written by Type Classes. Um, for those of you that haven't heard about Type Classes, it is run by Chris Martin and Julie Marinucci. And uh, it's a great service where they just put out lots of interesting Haskell tutorials and kind of walkthroughs. I know they've done like uh, how to write a HTTP server basically from scratch, which is mm -hmm. a really interesting little project to work through. So yeah, they're a cool service. You should go check them out at typeclasses.com. They offer subscriptions that are super cheap. So check them out.
Similarly, we work for a company called IT Pro TV who also provides uh, training. We're more focused on IT skills and we do video based training. Uh, so you should check us out as well. Go to itpro.tv. As you might guess, we use Haskell on the back end, so that's why we're here doing a podcast about it. Um, so yeah, I think that about wraps it up. Sarah, any closing thoughts? I would definitely recommend to anybody who's listening to this to try out Type Classes and try us out. All this information is very great and you can learn a lot of stuff from both sources. So if you're interested in learning, here are all the learns. <laughs> for sure. All right. Well, thank you for listening to the Haskell Weekly Podcast, and we'll see you again next week. See you guys. Bye.